I'm Laura Vinroot Poole. For 20 years, I've owned Capital, an internationally recognized specialty store. Capital has never really been about fashion. It's always been about people. What We Wore was created to share the meaningful journeys that inspire me. From the designers and friends I meet on the road to the men and women with whom I work each day. Everybody wants to know her. Alan Bedwell's antique journey started at the early age of 11, working alongside his mother at Gray's Antique Market in London. He went on to work as an antiques buyer and accessories designer at Ralph Lauren and created a collection for Bergdorf Goodman, which launched his business, Foundwell. Alan Bedwell, I'm, I'm so happy you're here virtually with me on the program. <laughs> and, and where are you, Alan? Uh, in New York City at this uh, current moment. I was supposed to be joining you this weekend uh, coming down, but obviously COVID has put paid to that, sadly. So you've been in New York the whole time through the pandemic? Yes. I, I took my first trip out of the city to, I have, uh, because of the way things have gone, you know, recently, I've had a few friends leave, move to Connecticut and move to <laughs> Long Island and escape, essentially. So my first trip was about probably two months ago, and I, I went to to visit my friend who'd moved to Connecticut. So up that. until that point, I was a prisoner here, yeah. <laughs> I love that that's a trip, too, from New York to Connecticut. I, was, <laughs> I know, oh, really. It was, it, was. A, it was a real escape, yeah. <laughs> I detect a little bit of an accent, so I don't think you're from New York. <laughs> it's mid-Atlantic, I think they call it these days. Unfortunately, I've been, been corrupted from my... Uh, from my time here and when I go back to England I have the uh, sad realization that I don't quite sound like I used to when I get into a taxi and I ask to go somewhere and then the driver's oh where are you from mate you're from Australia and I'm like oh my god I'm born and bred in London oh my gosh well yeah. that I went to school in New England and that would happen to me too. When I came home, people would say like, I don't even understand what you're saying. Where's your accent? You know, I'm like, I don't, I don't <laughs> it's <think> heartbreaking. <laughs> it's, it's really painful. I know, um, yeah. <laughs> but you are, you're from the UK and you, how long have you been in New York? Well, March next year, I think will be 13 years. I've oh, been wow. here. So yeah, I've, I've had a good stint at this point. Yeah. <laughs> so you're here. I am here. Yes. Yeah. I mean, for how for how long? I don't know. I keep changing my mind on that all the time. But uh, yeah, but you grew up in London. I did. Yes. Yeah. Uh, North London, born and raised. My parents, in fact, still live in the same house. So uh, yeah, very much, uh, very much there. I have two sisters, both still in London, uh, one a little bit more central, but one, yeah, like five minutes from where we grew up. Uh, made very much a Londoner. <laughs> Your mother was in the antiques business. Uh, well, she still is. Yeah, bless her. I mean, she's. Ah. Uh, I, I won't. I'm not allowed to say how old she is because I'll <laughs> never be allowed to go home if I do ever go home. Is it similar to what you do, or does she deal in the same sort of in, in silver and things like that, or is it? No, I mean, actually, very well. I mean, very different. She's an antique dealer, obviously, but she focuses on jewelry, uh, ladies' oh, wow. jewelry. So. Um, very Love. different, really. Yeah. I mean, I think you, you'd like it a lot more than what I do, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. And and did your mom do that for, for your whole childhood? Oh, yeah. I mean, she went into secretarial college, I think, out, outside of school and uh, crazily enough worked, I think, for a whale oil firm for a while. And then <laughs> uh, I know it's very strange business but that's uh, I guess back in the day that was a business it wasn't arpege made from whale oh oil. yeah absolutely yeah I mean it was quite yeah. a commodity back in the day yeah and, uh, yeah it really was oh, one antique business to the next <laughs> exactly <laughs> exactly yeah yeah <laughs> and then straight into jewelry antique jewelry well kind of so one of her friends I think uh one weekend uh, basically kidnapped my mom and was like let's go antiquing you know I really want to go go with you and go find some stuff. And I think it was really that. And she caught the bug and then they started to go more regularly. I think my mom decided, actually, I think she was working, she was working at this antique clock company. So I think she left the whale oil firm, went into this antique clock company that was very prestigious in the West End of London, selling, you know, extremely expensive, very complicated clocks all over the world. 
and kind of got a bit of the bug from there. And then I think she just had my sister. And so was kind of working part time there. And so she, she decided there was a, there used to be a very, you know, popular antique kind of flea market called the Camden passage, which was in Islington in North London. And, uh, yeah, my mum decided, I think, one Wednesday morning to take a, take a table there and, you know, put out some of her wares. And uh, she basically sold out, I think, within like 20 minutes and had all these people coming up to, you know, being like, oh, you've got a great eye, you know, come back next week, find more things, blah, blah, blah. And then actually she was kind of quite caught up and involved in the, in the kind of 60s fashion uh, business at the time, too. So she was working with Bieber and Adina Rone and wow. people like that. Um, she was actually selling Victorian lace and Art Deco buttons and things like that, that these ladies were putting on their, you know, um, couture creations. So it was a really fun time. And I think, you know, she loved it. And then I think she also got the bug of being, you know, independent and an entrepreneur. And really, that was it. She never looked back. And yeah, she's had a, a place in Grey's Antique Market in London, which is, you know, probably the the, the, the most well-known market in in London for I guess 40 years now wow and she she must be a stylish woman I mean I think my husband always says that taste kind of has to flow over to all the things that you do yes <laughs> you know and so does she was she a beautiful dresser and had beautiful jewelry a very beautiful dresser I mean it's funny my sisters and I talk about this quite regularly that a woman who's you know bought and sold jewelry some amazing jewelry over the years she's she was very good about not, you know, getting too high in her own supply. Whereas I, unfortunately, am very guilty of doing that. And <laughs> I find it very hard to sell a lot of things. And so uh, I have uh, perhaps a slightly indulgent collection of certain things that I like to keep. So, yeah, she's kept jewellery. But it's, yeah, funnily, you know, funnily enough, not really as much as, you know, certainly my sisters would hope, <laughs> you know, with their eye on it. But, uh, yeah, she's, she's, she's just kind of dressed how she wanted to dress and uh yeah it's uh she was very stylish and my dad was stylish too my dad you know was a was a uh, banker in the city of london and very classic english gentleman really you know suit to work every day and you know highly polished shoes and so yeah i grew up with a uh, you know with with parents who you know were very proud and always uh you know kept up their appearances so it definitely rubbed off on me for sure yeah and how and do you remember at what age you sort of wanted to be a part of it or or felt connected to it it was very much uh, against my will really a, a younger <laughs> age <laughs> because when your parents and um, there's lots of people who empathize with me on this when your parents are in the in the antiques business you kind of get dragged along every weekend to <laughs> to antique shows and you know you're you're the porter carrying heavy boxes unpacking repacking I was given my first kind of 50 pounds to go to shows when I was probably I was young, so I was probably 11, I would guess 11 or so. And I, would, I was given the remit to buy silver or gold charms that I found interesting, predominantly silver cufflinks, silver and enamel cufflinks. That was kind of my remit. Yeah. Was it immediately a language that you understood? So I, I always think about like for me with, with buying and I mean, I've done it for 25 years, but every season, yeah. first appointment, I'm like, oh my God, maybe I've lost my taste. Like, maybe I won't be able to do this anymore. And then you see the first dress and you're like, no, oh, this is so obvious. I know what I'm doing. Did it, did it feel like that from the first minute you did it? Like you, you Yeah, I have to yeah. say, you're looking back, you know, it's very weird this because my, my life and career path um, has taken a very kind of unexpected journey in, in a way. And uh, yeah, it was very very natural to me um and it's not something you get trained obviously I think you either kind of have an eye or you don't really yeah. I guess I was lucky that that I kind of saw things that I liked that resonated with other people you know I have a very simple philosophy with my business and, and that's if I just need one person who's crazy enough like me to like what I'm <laughs> buying <laughs> yeah exactly and it's one person in the world <laughs> exactly exactly you like with the internet these days i can find that crazy person somewhere out there you know i love that and so you went to university what did you study in england when you when you kind of graduate from kind of middle high school to the last years of high school before college you, you specialize in three or four subjects what you we you did in my day anyway i think things are different now <laughs> So I did art, history and economics and I had a kind of, you know, love for all of them, as I said, because I grew up with my dad, kind of banker, my mum, 
in the kind of arts world. So it was left, right side of the brain was always kind of engaged. But I kind of wanted to be a designer. I actually wanted to be a product designer. That was my that was my my kind of goal. I thought at that period of my life. And uh, I, I say a friend of uh, my parents is a guy called Sir Kenneth Grange, who those people in the product design business will know very well. He started a very famous uh, design agency called Pentagram. And I was a huge fan of his from, from meeting him at a young age. Uh, he was always very stylish, always wore a bow tie, had a beautiful house, lovely chap and supremely talented. And um, I was fortunate enough after high school to go, I took a year off between going to university and I did some work experience at Pentagram with him. And it was quite a daunting experience, really. And it really changed what I thought I wanted to do. And I wasn't sure that I wanted to be so specialized because, you know, when you go down a design path, it's very difficult then to, say, go into finance. It was it, The door would have been closed. So uh, I kind of liked the project management side of design at that point. And I thought, OK, so I'll do a general business degree and then that will kind of keep my options open. So I did a business management degree with a finance specialism and uh, in, in Manchester. And I mean, by the time I kind of got into that, I really thought, actually, you know what, I'm probably just going to go down the banking route and then make some money and then perhaps pursue something more creative down the line. Um, <laughs> so that As one I kind does. of did a roller coaster, really. <laughs> what were some of the things at Pentagram? What did they create? He did everything from a very famous train in the UK called the Intercity 125. But when I was working there, they were working with JBL and designing speakers. I remember that oh, project wow. was something that I kind of was shadowing one of the designers on. Yeah, I mean, supremely talented people. Amazing. I mean, one of the jobs that Sir Kenneth gave me, which was, <laughs> I think, to try and weed me out in a way, was <laughs> they, were, they, they had no jobs at the agency. He gave me this huge stack of, of uh, CVs, resumes to go through. And he was like, go through those and put the ones aside that you think are good. And I literally was throwing <laughs> people's lives in the trash. And here I was, what, probably 18 years old, you know. But isn't and it, it was, amazing what people put on CVs? I mean, have you Oh, unbelievable. Having... And, and some and... of them were so talented. And I was like, oh, my God, I, <laughs> these guys, I'm, what am I even thinking about? These guys, they don't even have a job. They're applying from all over the world to work here. It was a real, it was, I mean, he was very smart in doing that because it was a real, you know, real eye opener to me, honestly. Yeah. And also like, look at all the experience that these people have been like, oh, yeah. what oh, have gosh. I done? I mean, <laughs> unbelievable, really. Yeah. And so how did you go from banking to antiques? Well, so I graduated in the summer of 2001. And once again, uh, my life was not, um, you know, my choosing. So I came back from Manchester to London. Uh, I enjoyed, you know, most of the summer in Manchester with all my friends that were kind of going to different parts of the country afterwards. And then came back and then I was like, okay, I'll get serious about looking for a job now. And then obviously September the 11th happened and, you know, the whole world came to a stop, really. Uh, certainly in the finance world, there were about 10,000 redundancies in, in the city of London in about, you know, four or five weeks. And they cancelled all graduate recruitment. Wow. So, I, I literally didn't have a choice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh, there I was actually, you know, interviewing. My dad also worked with Lloyds of London as an underwriter at syndicates there in, in insurance. And so I, I had uh, interviews at Benfield and a couple of other places in the insurance business while actually then working for my mum back in the shop just to make some money. And at the time, we, my mother used to sell to Ralph Lauren in London there was a lady there called Margaret who used to, she used to buy all the antiques for the London stores. She was then replaced by this other lady who was a friend of my sister's and my sister's a jeweler in the UK. And so she would do stuff for Ralph as well. And this lady mentioned in passing to my sister, Oh, I'm, I'm pregnant and you know, I'm not actually going to come back. I'm going to take my maternity leave and I won't come back. So if you know anyone that might be interested in my job, you know, it would make me feel a lot better about myself if I don't leave them in the lurch. Mm -hmm. And so my sister said to her, actually, I'll ask my brother because perhaps it might be something he might be interested in. So she told me, she's like, yeah, this job, blah, blah, blah. And so, I, you know, at this point, really, I had, I didn't know what to <laughs> do. She's like, whatever, sounds good. Yeah, really. I was like, it's a job. <laughs> I'll take it. And actually, you know, I actually really loved Ralph Lauren. I liked their clothing and 
I love the aesthetic and the store. I don't know if you've ever been to the store on, on Bond Street in London. It's a beautiful yeah. store. And so I thought, okay, wow, you know, why not? So I, I put my, my CV in and, and applied and had an interview with, with a man called Jeff Charlton. And, uh, you know, I'd been for quite a few banking interviews and quite a few insurance interviews at this point. So this was really a cakewalk for me. <laughs> there were no like math questions or frightening questions that were being thrown at me. So, you know, I, I explained to him, you know, my mother's an IT dealer and I've been helping her with her business since a young age. And, you know, honestly, I was, I was very cocksure at the time. And I was like, honestly, I could do this with my eyes closed. And I think this guy was very taken aback because I was probably... I can't imagine. I was probably 22 or something, maybe. <laughs> he crazily hired you, I guess. Well, it went back and forth. I, did, it took, I didn't hear anything. So I was, uh, you know, another one of these job interviews I've not heard anything from. Right. And then I randomly got an email probably six weeks later to say, we're still interested in you. The job titles changed. So the job was actually to buy all the antiques for the Ralph Lauren European stores. And then uh, I got this follow-up email from HR saying, uh, you know, Mr. Charlton would like to have you back in again because the, the job description has changed a little bit and actually you'll be assistant buyer for tabletop gift, stationery, and drum roll, please, dog. <laughs> <laughs> That's a category. So, oh, my God. And buying the antiques. So I was like, okay, I mean, whatever. That's fine. Whatever. That's a, sure. Yeah, so I went back in. Had I think two more interviews and then yeah I finally got offered the job so yeah dog dog not many people know that actually that should have been on my question not many people know that I used to buy Ralph Lauren dog jackets. Yeah. You have a dog? <laughs> I didn't yeah I think we did have a dog well we did have a dog my mum and dad had a dog at the time yeah <laughs> best dressed dog in North London. <laughs> exactly and then was the was the interview did it have questions like what's the difference between a calling card and a correspondence card? Or no yes. really it wasn't particularly <laughs> technical honestly because you know, really, Jeff was the buyer, and I was really just going to be the assistant buyer, you know, chiming in with a little bit, I guess, of what I thought was interesting, and doing a lot of the, you know, the, the raising of purchase orders and all that fun stuff that, you know, did the, the entry level fashion jobs that a lot of people don't understand uh, entail, really, you know, a lot of spreadsheets, and back in those days, very early, pretty crappy computer systems. You know? <laughs> when I have young people interview with me that say they really want to get into buying I'm like you you realize that 90% of it is in excel right like you'll spend oh, yeah. 90% of your day in excel is that is that what you are interested in <laughs> yeah uh cuz i don't think that most of it is like your your experience of sourcing antiques but no i mean i was very lucky so i had that you know i was lucky enough to have that part of the job that was fun for me you know and yeah. i actually took the business and I really did incredibly well, you know, um, by the time I left it, I, it was, it was, a, I, we were doing over a million euros a year. So, I mean, it was kind of a, a big, I took it from, you know, 200 grand to over a million in, in five years. It was a huge, huge business. And I raised the gross margin from like 18% to 42%. So Amazing. I left with my head held high and it did a great <laughs> job really. And, uh, but that was, yeah, like you said, that was really the fun part for me because the rest of it was you know pretty mundane pretty boring and yeah lots of spreadsheets and you know all that kind of stuff but you know it was a really good it was a very good education in the business side of retail maybe the biggest education is understanding the client and, and that you're buying for a client no matter in what business you are whether it's at ralph or at your mom's antique store right yeah because our offices at the time were actually above the store on bond street and so i would quite often get called down to meet some of the clients that the my more high profile clients and help sell the pieces obviously because i bought them so i knew the stories and i knew a little bit more of the history and you know lady lady bamford was a, a, a big client of ours at the time and you know i would come down and talk her through the cases and and show pieces that i thought um, lady bamford would find interesting and you know i quite often would buy pieces with her in mind like you said you yeah. I, I used to buy for certain people you know when i saw something i'd be like oh you know lady b would love that and don't you think one of the biggest as you said the biggest ways to sell is to tell the story i mean i think that oh about gosh yeah well i mean you have to know all of the stories right yeah Absolutely. And it doesn't matter if you're selling a dress, you know, that's made by a designer today or, you know, a piece of silver from 200 years ago. 
you know, the, the dresser who's designing the dress today, his story is is as compelling, I'm sure, you know, and the fabrics he chooses and, you know, the silhouettes he picks and what inspired him. And, you know, it's it's all, yeah, it really brings everything alive, you know, which is why, you know, Pete, I have conversations with people in retail who, you know, a lot of people are panicking, as I'm sure, you know, you know, too, from all your connections in retail. But I still feel, you know, as much as the internet is going to be, I mean, it's changed the business, obviously, but that that conversation that showing people in person that kind of hand touch if you like is never going to go away it's just not no and i think it i think that the stores that will will survive this are the ones that can tell the story yeah i mean that's the thing you could buy i mean you can't buy antiques anywhere from anyone but you can buy you could buy a ralph lauren dress anywhere from anyone yes <laughs> and i exactly. guess exactly it's who tells the story best about it i think yes yeah absolutely and that's funny you know because even i think even stores like ralph lauren have lost that ability there are oh, stores they, that are doing that better with their own merchandise which is kind of crazy I, when you think about it isn't it that is i mean and and the people that used to work in the mansion like in the 80s i mean that was a whole different caliber of, of people too sales people too i mean that, that oh 100 percent, 100 percent. and so how long were you at ralph before you left within i think my second or third week at ralph lauren we we were moved offices because they were massively planning to grow the european business right. um back at this point i think they only had i think four or five owned stores a lot of it was franchised and ralph really wanted to expand his footprint on Europe. You know, it's hard to believe but when I joined, there was no store in Italy. There was no store in Spain. In Paris. Uh, there. I think there was only the one store in Paris. So there was a huge plan to grow the business. And so we were, we were, they were going to employ a lot of people in the buying team there. So I was kicked out and moved above the children's store at 143 New Bond Street. And uh, next door to me uh, was this other small office. And uh, being the nosy guy I was, I poked my head in there and, and literally walked into an Aladdin's cave. It was kind of everything I ever kind of dreamt about as a kind of design office. There were vintage books, vintage bags, vintage pieces, amazing modern books, sketches scattered everywhere. And this this amazing, beautifully dressed Scottish guy popped his head up and was like, hello. And I said, hi. And I said, what do you do? And he said, oh, he said, oh, I'm the uh, accessories designer for Ralph Lauren. And I just looked at him and I laughed and I was like, I want your job. <laughs> <laughs> and literally from that moment on, him and I became very, very good friends. And uh, I literally wanted to work for him. And it took me the best part of five years of nagging and complaining. And then I eventually met his boss from New York when he came over. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> Being a general pest, essentially. And so John Calcagno was his boss and John came over. He used to come over to London two or three times a year. And when he came over, Raymond introduced me. And then I used to harass John all the time. <laughs> and, uh, you know, as they say, the squeaky, the squeaky uh, wheel gets the oil. So eventually they were looking to grow the men's accessories design team in New York. And uh, I had, a, I guess, I had an interview. And then, yeah, I got offered the job to, to be, you know, junior designer uh, for the men's accessories team in New York. So at that time, it was kind of, it was polo and purple. It was, hmm. you know, it was kind of a bit of everything, really. Was it soul crushing to translate the sort of accessories that you were weaned on um antiques uh, beautiful english antiques to mainstream america <laughs> oh no not at all you know i really that was kind of the, the beauty of it, is it and that's kind of why i always the had opposite. an affection for, for ralph was that he really it was very very inspired by by the beauty of the past you know whether it was the, f the fashion or the objects the lifestyle everything and uh it was really easy for me to kind of you know, it was just the right fit for me aesthetically, given my kind of background to, to be in that position, really. And I think it's why, why I really loved it there. You know, uh, it, was a, it was a good fit, really. And, and we, we were very, I was very lucky at the time. As I had I said, you know, Raymo Avella and John Cacani were great, very, very talented people. And I was lucky enough to work, you know, with Ralph, you know, and Jerry, of course, his brother was, you know, my, my sort of boss as well. And, you know, phenomenally intelligent successful driven yeah. visionary people that you know they're almost once in a lifetime people so to get the chance to work with these people was was an absolute blessing really so the Bergdorf thing really came about because sadly because it was 
again this was you know 2008 time now at this point uh, so we're going from like just shit show to shit show exactly uh, i was Sorry. really getting beaten around the houses honestly and so um so i wasn't really making any money on uh, there were no pay rises honestly i was lucky to get a job you know quite a few people in my department were let go and i was on a visa here sponsored by ralph lauren and i was struggling for money and i was really at a crossroads where it was either go back to London and, and take another job or, or find another way to make money. Mm -hmm. At the time, I was dating this lovely girl, Alison Farrell, and she was working at Bergdorf's at the time. She was the buyer for the home department. I went to a, to a, a cocktail party there one night. She was a very big fan of mine and, and used to, to promote me. She was very <laughs> sweet in that respect. Her boss at the time was a lady called Margaret Spaniola, and she, who ran Bergdorf's. And Margaret was at the party, and Alison went running over to her and said, "Oh, Alison, you have to meet my boyfriend, Alan. He's, you know, he used to buy all the antiques for all the uh, European stores around Florin. Um, I know that we we need, you know, new antique people here." So uh, Margaret came over, and we had a chat, and uh, then Margaret introduced me to this gentleman called Brooks Thomas. Um, who was the DMM for the men's store, he said, you know, well, here's my card, you know, give me an email and, and let's talk. So kind of fast forward, I guess, six, seven weeks, I lined up a meeting with um, Brooks. I furiously got buying antiques <laughs> like I'd never done before. Uh, I basically put all my money I had, which was not very much. And my parents very kindly lent me a little bit of money too to to put together what I thought was a, was a great collection and we had this great apartment. Did you do that in New York or did you go to, to the- No, UK? London, it was all London. I, I didn't know the New York antique scene at all at that point. So yes. it was all London. It was in person also, Alan, right? Like, it well, was a little bit on the phone, honestly. I said to Michael, you know, I'm, I, I need to do this. And Michael had actually worked with previous Bergdorf buyers. So he knew he knew the remit quite well and he knew me from Berg, uh, Ralph Lauren days. So, yeah. you know, it was quite easy for him to, to help me on that respect. And uh, there I was all very proud of everything and he looked it was like yeah this is nice uh, I need three times the amount and uh <laughs> you know you've got like four weeks to do it and I I kind of gulped was feeling a little bit sick and was like oh of course yes no problem, no problem. you know and did blah, they blah, fund blah. it or no no absolutely not no wow. no no it was all consignment I guess I robbed a couple of banks I don't really remember <laughs> I mean my parents must have lent me more money and then I guess whatever I probably sold a kidney or something at that point <laughs> And uh, was able to raise a bit more money and, and buy. I didn't get anywhere near to three times the amount, but I probably got you know, another 50% of the amount of stuff. But I think I cheated by, by getting a few bigger pieces. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so that first season, was it successful from the game? Oh, I mean, it was beyond. I mean, I was very blessed. Brooks Thomas was a, was a you know, beautifully dressed, very tasteful, you know, real retail guy. And uh I was petrified. I'm not really a public speaker, and I he I had to do an an all store presentation to to launch the collection to every single member of staff in the store. By the way, also I'm playing hooky from Ralph Lauren because exactly. it's it's nine o'clock in the morning before the store opens. I'm supposed to be at my desk across. Fortunately, is literally across the street at six fifty Madison. Coffee break. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to be a little bit late for work that day. <laughs> And so Brooks got up and introduced me and he said, you know, I've worked here. I, I can't remember. He said something like 18 years at Bergdorf. He said, this is the finest collection of antiques we've been lucky enough to have in this store. Let me introduce you to Alan Bedwell, owner of Found One. After he said that, I kind of was like, oh, wow, that's kind of impressive introduction. So it made me feel a lot better about the whole situation. And, and then I, I bumbled through, you know, how excited I was and, you know, explained a few pieces and a few people fell asleep at the back of the room I think but it went very well and yeah it really was it was the start of the business really I'm very very grateful to that opportunity you know both to Alison to push it and for Margaret and Brooks to to give me the opportunity because gosh I mean I was what I couldn't have been more than 26 years old at that point 27 years old maybe wow. I mean kind of crazy really yeah. and do yeah. you still love it do I still love doing doing what I'm doing yes uh, yes, I just, it's changed so much, honestly. Uh, and I don't want to sound like a curmudgeon, like, oh, you know, back in my day, but, and I'm not that old, but, you know, the internet has really, really, really changed the business. Yeah, so in, in some ways for, for good, but in many ways, it's kind of changed it for bad, I would say. It's very, it's very 
different let's put it that way um i still love handling the pieces i still my passion is for product really it's you know the business is important to pay the bills but really i just love antiques and beautiful objects and even modern stuff you know i love i i respect a lot of you know contemporary designers and i respect a lot of people that are doing great things today so it's just the business part of it has become a lot more challenging really you know the, i i founded my business with burgles and i founded my business then working with other department stores all over the world and th- as you know the department store business is is basically gone you know i my unfortunately my business went kind of in a downward trajectory you know lockstep with the department store business because it was they were my clients so right, right. Yeah, it's become it was it's been a very difficult, you know, five years for everybody really involved in retail. And I've had to pivot. And it's, you know, I've been lucky enough to get the chance to work with Tabor. And last year was was it's kind of that's the new evolution of what I'm doing the way is is working with with smaller, more focused, beautiful uh, local retailers, where I think that's really where for my business, the future is reaching those people that kind of understand it. You know your your top clients that really appreciate design and history and beauty and you know and you have that that that's the difference too that I think you'll it will resonate with you too I think is that like we talked about before those older sales guys who had they had their customers phone numbers they would call them up and say oh you know Mr Smith your tie is in that you you know you need this tie or Miss Smith you know the the heavyweight winter tweeds are in come in and we'll get you fifty you know. Right. Those relationships, you bring in the new generation of salespeople and that was all gone, all gone. Yeah, I observed. I mean, I've been doing this 25 years and I remember now recently when we have trunk shows, you know, you send, you send, you send an email out, you might send a text to a client. You obviously it's all over social media and you do that for weeks leading up to it. And then, you know, it either is successful or it's not for whatever reason. Usually for me, I think it's just like a phase of the moon or something, (laughs) but in the old days, the best salespeople, they didn't even tell the client, they may have said it in passing that, you know, we have this trunk show coming up in a month or something, mm, mm. but the real successful ones were the ones that called the morning of the trunk show and said, you know, Mrs. Edwards, that we have the most amazing show. You have to get over here right now. Yeah, <laughs> and she wow. would call, Like they would all come right then and, yeah. and, and they would just crush it, you know, and it's just the pivoting is really interesting that you have to all, you have to be sort of observing and understanding what's happening all the time and how things are changing. And if you want to be a part of it. I mean, it's also, it's a good time to hang your hat and just be like, all right, I'm done with this. Like, I can't, figure it, I can't figure it out anymore, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's quite tempting, honestly. <laughs> I feel like that. I feel, uh, yeah, take a, take a small house on a small island somewhere and uh, put my feet up and, and thanks for the memories, really. I have said also many times during the pandemic, I'm really grateful for 2008 because I don't know that I would be, I wouldn't even know how to fight if I hadn't gone through that. I wouldn't, sure. I wouldn't know how to work through this or try to even figure it out if I hadn't gone through that. Yeah. Well, a lot of people say that to me too. That's basically when I started Farmwell. So they were like, well, if you were making money back then, you know, you can really survive anything. And it's, it is right. obviously true. I mean, it's this year, you know, I did a, an amazing sale with Sotheby's this, uh, in the height of the pandemic in May. And yeah. it was a blowout success. I got 96% sell through. So, you know, it's, you know, you, it, it gives you the validation that, okay, I'm doing something right. You know, I'm not a complete idiot, you know, something works. Well, and it's not, I think the thing is, and, and I think this about our stores too, and definitely about your product is like, it's an incredible product. It's an incredible story. We have incredible clients. It's just the vehicle at which you get the product to those people. How do you share that story? How do you tell that story? How do you get the product to them? And all of that stuff changes. And that's what you really have to figure out, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah. And you know, the whole Instagram thing and yeah, that's you got to be a part of it. It's, I mean, it's that's fun. the thing. I, 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 I hate, you know, personally, I don't, I don't, have a, a, an Instagram I don't I, I have a Facebook but I, I've never put anything on there in my life I mean my friends have annoyed me to tag me and stuff over the years but yeah I've never posted a picture I'm very private in that respect and I, I, I hate my I, it's from my mother it stems from my mother my mother's always been very private and we've always kept our, ourselves out of the limelight for me it's not about me it's about the product but I'm having to embrace that. And, and part of the reason to come out and talk to you today is that I, there's, there's an element today that in order to be successful, you have to come out from behind the curtain. Yeah. 
yeah. you know, it's found well as an entity is great. And it's, I love what it represents and, and, and the product, but I think a lot of people want to know, oh, who is, who's the guy behind found well? Like, what does he do? What's his story? And I think selling yourself now is almost as important as what you're selling, you know, and which is sad to me, honestly, yeah, because yeah. the product should stand for itself, you know. But I think the fact that, Alan, you're not able or we are not able so often to be in the presence of the client in person, yeah. you have to find ways to, to tell that story. My mom says you should only, your, your name should only be in the paper twice in your life, your birth announcement and your obituary. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I've done a few more than that, but I, <laughs> but I get it. I have the same kind of mother. What are the two or three or one most interesting items that you've come across um, that you've ever found? And did you sell them or did you keep them? Oof, wow. That's a very, <laughs> very good question. Yeah. I mean, it's very hard to pinpoint um, certain things, but I mean, I'm actually looking at one of them right now. So it's, he's, he's literally tapping me on the shoulder. So coming from the kind of, um, the fashion world, you know, in the end from the Ralph Lauren side of it, I kind of got a lot more interest in that world, uh, and its effect on retail and the magazine business. I happened to be at an antique show one time and I saw this, this, I guess it's probably foot and a half, two foot gentleman, in, in great kind of 1940s attire, kind of caricature, very strange looking. And I said to the seller, you know, what's this? And he said, oh, that's Esky. And I said, well, what's Esky? And he said, well, that's Esquire magazine. And I was like, okay. And he said, he used to be on the cover of every Esquire magazine up until I think the 70s, I want to say. So he was basically a character. So they never had models. They never had celebrities. They never had designers on the covers they had this character esky that is so weird sketched up in you know in the summer he'd be in a you know in a woolen bathing suit and in the winter he'd be in a tweed jacket and uh, he'd be doing various different types of things and so i didn't buy it at the time so it actually wasn't in amazing condition but there was something amazing about it right and so i came home and i did lots of research and yeah sure enough there he was and Amazing. And then I started to do some research about the figures. So the figures were made from a kind of resin and hand painted. And there were smaller ones that, you know, let's say your shirt was featured in Esquire magazine. You could, I, I don't know whether they'd send you one or you'd write off to the magazine and they would, they would give you one and you could put it in the store and it's the Esky and it says this, this was seen in Esquire magazine. Right. And so you put it next to the shirt. And also they had these much bigger ones. And so a friend of mine, Ryan, who used to work with me, she was also the buyer at Ralph Lauren in the US for all the antiques. We became very good friends. We still are. She sent me a link on eBay one day about two years ago. I was like, oh my God, oh my God, have you seen this? And I said, no, what is it? And she said, it's Esky. I was like, oh, okay, cool. And she's like, no, 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 no. It's Esky, it's Esky. And I was like, what does that mean? She sent me the link and... Lo and behold, I have the Esky that was given to this chap by Esquire magazine that he had until he died. I have the photograph and I have a letter from uh, this chap who worked for his wife had a um, an Italian restaurant, I think, and he worked in the restaurant and he was very fond of both of them. And when he passed away, he inherited the Esky. And anyway, I have the Esky. And Alan, so. what is he wearing? He is wearing a beautiful blue suit with a white <laughs> shirt and red tie. I'll send you a picture so you get a little bit okay, more I of a, an understanding. I definitely need that. We ask everybody in the podcast what they wore to the prom, and I know you didn't have a prom. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, exactly. But how about, is there, do you have a favorite outfit, or do you have a, an outfit? <laughs> that <was> sort of, <laughs> do you have a favorite pair of cufflinks, or do you have um, something like that? I have, I mean, I have, this is, it's ludicrous, because I think I've worn it once, but I have a very beautiful off-white silk purple label suit that I, I think I've worn once. Where did you wear it? Uh, I wore it to a wedding. You know, what? Not surprisingly. Yeah, down south. Yeah, years oh, okay, ago. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, girls aren't allowed to wear white to wedding. No, it was, it was a southern wedding. So. <laughs> yeah, I probably would have 
probably got in trouble but i just it was like i, I didn't really know what else to wear it was it's it's a beautiful lightweight silk suit so yeah that's probably that would have been my prom that would have been my prom outfit i think what did you did you wear white bugs with it what did you wear? no i have two tone i have a cap toe Hi. ralph lauren purple label made by i'm quite sure they would be edward green or crockett and jones <laughs> yeah white white and tan cap toe brogue which and i wore it, with them yeah and shirt, what color shirt and tie it was a blue striped wing collar, white wing collar. And it was, I think I had on, I probably it was a silver silk tie, I think. This is a good look. I think, I hope this was in Mississippi or Alabama. Where, where was this? Uh, I was down in Charleston, actually. Okay, that works. That works. Yes, yes. <laughs> I felt very much at home there. I thought, you know, this is, <laughs> as an Englishman abroad down south, this is kind of what I should wear. Well, and Charlestonians are all Anglophiles, so that works. Yes, I think it, I think it went down quite well. <laughs> you were a hit. I was, yeah. <laughs> well, Alan, I love talking to you. Thank you so much. And um, pleasure. Thank you for your time. And uh, I hope I have not put your listeners to sleep. What we wore is produced by Capital and Balto Creative Media. The original song "Someone So Enchanting" was composed and performed by Britt Drazda. What We Wore is a member of the Queen City Podcast Network, powered by Ortho Carolina. Find out more at queencitypodcastnetwork.com.